Welcome, everybody. Today, we are talking about how to handle disappointing grades, ways to uncover the reasons behind your child's school performance, and how to help. I'm your host, Ann Dolan, and I do a lot of webinars for parents, but I have to tell you that compared to all the other topics, this one hits home for me um, because I've experienced this as a student myself. You know, when I was a kid, I really, really struggled in school, and I often brought home disappointing grades, and I began to feel like I was a big disappointment to my parents. Um, it was tough starting in elementary school. It started with struggling in math, and then it became a pervasive issue as I got, as I got older. But my parents realized what was happening, and, and they really wanted to support me. And there were some things that they did that were really helpful. I'll get to those later on. Um, and for me, as an adult now, um, and seeing my own kids, they're older now, 25 and 21, bring home disappointing grades, there are absolutely things we can do as parents that can make a difference and really set the trajectory. So now we're here at the end of the first quarter, and it is what we notice as parents and how we respond that's key in really setting our kids up for a better path forward because there is lots of time left in the school year to improve. So this is what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. We'll discuss these grades uh, in terms of uncovering the reason. Why is it that our kids are bringing home grades that we think could be better? What do we say to our kids when we see these things? And what can we do as a parent to help? It's probably the most important thing we'll discuss. And then when and why to bring in backup when it's necessary. All right, so if you're a parent, um, this disappointing grade that you're seeing at the end of the quarter might not be anything new. Grades are different than they were long ago. They're in real time. So we can go in at any time and see how our kids are doing. But it just becomes so real when we see that final report card grade. And we often think the questions to ourselves like, when should I bring this up to my child? I don't want to, you know, be too um, imposing, but I really want to have this conversation. What should I say so it doesn't feel like a lecture? Um, what should I do when I see that my kid may be improving or not doing so well? Should I, should I reward for good grades? Or should I take the opposite approach and should I punish for bad grades and take things away? Well, let's start by talking about what grades really mean in the first place. It used to be when we were growing up and we were kids that a bad grade was a D and an F. Um, but that's not really the case anymore, partially because of grade inflation. Now, kids are getting elevated grades that they weren't getting a generation ago. Um, in fact, an A is the most awarded grade now in the public school system. So when we see kids get a C these days, um, it tells me as an educator that that student really doesn't understand the content, that they're struggling um, with mastery of the material. Whereas before, if you got a C, you know, in our generation, it kind of meant average, but that is not the case anymore. Partially, this C is um, indicative of struggle because schools really want kids to do well, especially since COVID. And they have this culture of retakes. So if a student doesn't get a good grade on a test, the child has an opportunity to study, practice, and take it again later. And either they get that new grade or perhaps it's an average of the old grade and the new grade. Also, there are flexible due dates. And in some high school courses, teachers aren't take, they're taking work up until the last day of the quarter, which in theory sounds great, but for many kids, especially those with attention difficulties, it really exacerbates the problem of procrastination. And then lastly, we're seeing an elimination of zeros or limited zeros. You know, when we were growing up, if you got a zero because you didn't turn something in or you didn't take a test, and that was averaged with an 80, now you have a 40, which of course is a failing grade. But in many school systems, the lowest grade you can get is a 50. So take a 50 and an 80, and that's very different than that 40. So schools do want our kids to succeed. And that's why when we see grades like a C, 
it means that our student is likely having a hard time. We hear this from parents all the time. Every day they call our office and they're concerned about their kids. You know, it might be grades, it could be their study habits. Sometimes they go hand in hand. But what they often say is things like, you know, my child is really capable, but she's underperforming. Or he's so smart, but oh my gosh, he is so scattered. Or wow, she's really bright, but oh my gosh, she can't find a certain th anything. And she doesn't even know when things are due. She's bright, but disorganized. And it's important to hear that and know that to from parents, because sometimes when those things happen and parents see these struggles with their kids, it's easy to understand how kids get in this thing called a doom loop. And a doom loop can be dangerous. This is what happens. The student gets a bad grade, and it might not even be a D or an F. It could be a C. Um, it might even be a B minus when they've when they've practiced and studied for hours and hours on end. So they get this grade, and what happens? They get criticism from others, like parents. Um, you could have studied harder. Did you turn in all your work? Um, you can do better next time. So they like even though it's not overly um, critical, it can be a subtle criticism. And it might not just be from a parent. It could be from your teachers. It could be from your sports coach. That results in lowered confidence. And when kids have lowered confidence, they put in limited effort. And it is this reduced effort that results in a bad grade all over again. I can tell you when I was a student, I was in a doom loop constantly. And it was terrible. It was awful. Um, and so we want to get our kids out of doom loops. There's no reason kids need to be stuck in doom loops. So what we do when we see that in our child is we have to figure out why. We need to be a detective. So sometimes the, sometimes the parents have enough information to figure this out. So they might be able to understand, you know, what is causing it. But oftentimes it's hard to tell. Um, when we work with kids, one of our first orders of business is really to dig deep, to be this detective and figure out why it's happening. Now, there are various causes of this. There are causes behind these poor grades. Here's the first one. Kids don't understand the content, right? They have a limited understanding of what they need to know for tests and quizzes. Sometimes they have weak executive function skills. They might understand the concepts, but they do not remember when they're supposed to turn things in or they forget or they don't write it down. Um, they have a hard time keeping a calendar. They forget about retakes. And so it is more of these executive function weaknesses that we'll talk about in a second that are causing the issue. But oftentimes it's a combination of both. In my case, it, it was really both. Um, and this is what often happens with kids where it might start out as one, but then the other kicks in or vice versa. But one other thing that we often see in kids is they don't have goal-directed behavior. And we often think of this as intrinsic motivation. So sometimes when kids get a bad grade, they'll think to themselves, oh, shoot, I want to do better. Let me study harder and pay attention more in class so I can improve myself and get a better grade. Not because I really care about math. I'm never going to use the Pythagorean theorem in my life, but I want to get a decent grade so that I can get a good GPA. And that GPA is going to allow me to study theater in college. And ultimately, that's what I want to do. That's goal-directed behavior. But sometimes when you're in the weeds as a student and you're feeling so down about things, you really also lack that goal-directed behavior. Um, and sometimes kids have a mental health concern. There are other issues that aren't really academic and they're struggling with things like stress, um, anxiety, or depression. So let's start there. If this is what's happening with your child and you see that they're overly stressed or anxious or they could be depressed, ask yourself, is this is it just this one class? Is it just right now or has this been a chronic issue? Um, have their behaviors and interests recently changed? Are you seeing something new for the first time? And could they potentially need professional help? Although this is not what we do, treat mental health issues, if you feel like your child is in this category, email me and I'm happy to give you a referral. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about that first reason I mentioned. 
kids that don't understand the content. Now, sometimes it's because a learning disability or a learning difference. Sometimes it's ADHD, um, which means attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's different than a learning disability. Sometimes kids, I call these kids Swiss cheese. These are kids that have difficulty paying attention in class, often girls, they look like they're paying attention to the teacher, but they're really not. They're, they're thinking of something else. And they have these holes in their learning, kind of like Swiss cheese. So they go to do their homework after school. And by the way, these kids are never behavior problems, but they go to do their homework after school and they remember some of it, but not other things. And so when they have these holes, they don't really know how to do their homework. And so they do parts of it, but not all of it. And then over time, it turns into, I'm just going to, you know, write something down or type something in and just say, I did it. And then it becomes, I'm not even doing it. So when kids are Swiss cheese, we want to intervene pretty quickly. Um, I was a Swiss cheese kid. It's super easy to happen. You might know if you have one in your house. And then lastly, sometimes kids specifically don't understand content in cumulative subjects. So the cumulative subjects are subjects where one thing builds upon another, like math, a math-based science in a foreign language. You may see this trend more in those areas where they're not quite getting the basics. And so it's very, very hard to learn more advanced material. They have a very shaky foundation. So when it is a content issue, um, you have to seek individualized academic attention for your child because kids cannot dig themselves out of a hole. Um, it's very, very hard. So if you say as a parent, oh, just when you math class, you focus more, go and ask the teacher for help. Make sure you're paying attention, work a little harder. Those things don't work for our kids. They need somebody to explain it to them in a different way. So we do this with kids all the time. And we need to assess the child to figure out, all right, what is it that you don't understand in these foundational areas? Where can I fill in the gaps as a tutor? Um, and that's really the first step because that just by itself helps kids to feel better. You know, one thing my parents did when I was a kid is they realized that I was really struggling and they got me a tutor starting when I was in fourth grade because I could not do long division. And that saved me. Um, off and on, I had tutors throughout middle school and high school in math. And that really was a lifesaver. But oftentimes when I started to do better, my parents would stop tutoring. And that's when I fell down again. I needed that consistent intervention. Um, so when we work with kids, we always want to make sure that we understand the gaps and that we also keep them to where learning what they are in class. It doesn't work when you just remediate. Kids also have to stay on top of their work. So they need help with their current, current um, instruction and they need help with their homework. And then another thing that we do, which is really helpful. So if you decide to seek academic um, attention for your child with, with somebody else or with us, and by the way, we're happy to help you. Um, I'd also recommend taking that last part of the session and previewing the material. And so there are lots of research that shows that if in a tutoring situation, even with a teacher, if the instructor says, okay, we've learned this, you've completed your homework. Now, let me show you what you're going to do tomorrow, um, or if it's block scheduling the day after. That way, when kids have a sense and they know what's going to happen next, they are far more focused in class because they understand what's going on. And there's lots of research that shows taking just a few minutes and previewing the material is just like gold. And then the other thing that's important is to make sure kids know how to study. Um, that's really key for kids. And in fact, in just thinking about math, kids will have often said to me over the years when I did a lot of tutoring in math, um, you know, Mrs. Dola, and you either know math or you don't, and there's not, you, you just can't study for it, like unlike history. And that's, that's actually not true at all. There are common threads for studying that work for all subjects. 
And there's actually a really great website called learningscientists.org. And it's developed for teachers, for parents, and for kids. And it, it shows you, based on research, um, the ways in which your brain retains information and you learn to study best. And so although there's many ways your brain can learn material and you can do better on tests, I'm just, because we don't have a lot of time together today, I'm going to pull out the top two. So here's um, one of them. It's called distributed practice. And sometimes people will call it spaced practice. But the concept is, instead of studying the night before for something like Thursday night for a math test on Friday, you take maybe that hour and, or maybe even that half hour, and you distribute it in smaller bursts over the preceding days. So maybe you do... 20 minutes on Tuesday, 20 minutes Wednesday, 20 minutes Thursday, or maybe it's 15 on Wednesday, 15 on Thursday. So this concept of doing something over a few days helps you retain information long term. So it's not just that you've crammed and you memorized it for the test the next day. When you do it over time, you know it for later on, and you really do need to know it for later on. The other way, oh, and also the reason this works is because when you practice it over time, and you sleep on it, that contributes to cementing the knowledge into long-term memory. All right, and here is the number one way. Um, this way really has been shown by research to trump everything else. And it's a concept called self-testing. It's basically when you say to yourself as a student or the tutor says to you um, or the teacher, hey, let's practice for this test in the same way that you are actually going to take the test. So here's an example. Let's say the teacher gives your child a study guide. This is what kids typically do. They will fill out the study guide. Usually they do this in class. And then to study, they will read through the study guide. And that's how they studied. In fact, there was a survey, a self-report survey for high school and college students asking them, what is the way in which you study and 85% of kids said, I study by reading my notes. This is the worst way to study. It does not help you retain information. So if the teacher gives you a study guide, don't just do it in class. We teach our kids, all right, we're going to make two more copies. So maybe you do that on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, you're going to take that blank copy, fill it out as best you can, and you're going to do the same thing on Thursday. So now you're practicing it over time, and it's kind of like you're testing yourself. You can also create your own study guide um, in math. This is gold. You look at some practice problems and you write them down and you do them on your own and you can look back if you need to. Um, we also teach kids how to use Quizlet. There are ways to use Quizlet so that you're also using this methodology called self-testing. Now, those are ways in which kids can learn to get better grades. But sometimes kids will say, I get to the test and I am so nervous, I go blank. I don't know what to do, what is wrong with me? And this is a common thing we see in kids that they become really anxious. Part of the reason is they haven't practiced enough in the test taking modality. So if the test is a multiple choice test, they should be practicing in the same type of format so they do that a couple times before the test. So when they walk in for the first time, it's not like, oh my gosh, I've never seen this before. They have seen it because they practice this way. If it's an essay test, they have seen it. They've practiced this way. So studying in the format of the test. We do this naturally when our kids are little. We give them spelling tests. Um, that's better saying, okay, Jimmy, spell because, and they write it down. That's better than giving them the words and telling them to read it over. And then there was another study done by University of Chicago looking at ways in which kids can decrease um, test anxiety. And they found out that when kids, anxious kids, jot down their worries right before they take a test, they can perform just as well as their non-anxious peers. Basically, they're getting all their worries out of the frontal lobe onto paper, right? And they're um, dumping it there. So they can then free up their frontal lobe, which is their executive function skills, to focus on what they need to to do well on the test. 
So we just mentioned executive function skills. You know, these are big things when it comes not just to test anxiety, but to like bigger issues. Um, and test executive functions are these mental processes in the frontal lobe of your brain that are really, really important for school success. So they have to do with things like organizing yourself, not just your materials, but knowing what you need to do when you come home to do your homework. What am I going to do first, second, or third? Knowing when something is due. Being able to say, okay, I need to sit down and do this. Let me get focused. And then sustaining your attention long enough to, to finish the task. Um, it also has to do with knowing when you're off track and when maybe you're working on an assignment and before you know it, you're watching YouTube videos. Are you able to say, oh, I shouldn't really be doing this right now. Let me go back to my work. That's a monitoring. It's also called self-regulation and that's an executive function skill. So sometimes when kids um, understand the material, but they're still not quite doing well in school, it may be because they have weak executive function skills. Now, sometimes people with weak executive function skills also have ADHD, but not always. But everybody that has ADHD always has weak executive function skills. And I say that um, because it's important to know, is this causing some of the issues your child is experiencing? And are they willing to accept your help or are they resistant to your overtures? Um, because when you see your child looking disorganized, it's just, especially if we're type A parents, we want to jump in and help. But sometimes our kids push back and they don't want our help. Sometimes kids are willing and they're willing to accept our help. But when kids are getting low grades, we as parents need to know what's happening. And we don't want to just say to ourselves, oh, shoot, you know. Um, you'll grow out of it, or, oh, maybe you'll do better next quarter. Oftentimes, when kids have these weaknesses, it doesn't get better without some intervention. And we also need to know how they're doing. So being able to sit down with them and look to see how are they doing in school? Um, what are their grades like? Do they have missing work? So if your child is willing, you can set up a regular check-in time with your child. And that might be once a week. Don't do it on your own. Don't go to the homework portal on your own and see that they have missing assignments and bad grades and then have a discussion because you don't know the other side of the story. It needs to be with your child. And if you don't feel like you have that relationship or it's going to go sideways and there's going to be major conflict over this, it's perfectly fine to outsource this and have somebody else who can check in on your child's grades who can figure out, is this executive function? Is it a mastery issue, issue and can teach them study habits? Um, that's what an executive function coach does. So when we use do this with kids, we do this every single session. Let me see your learning management system, which is Canvas, be Blackboard. We wanna see what do you have coming up and how are you doing in these classes? And then when we figure out, all right, Let's see, in math, it looks like you have this due, you know, next week, you have this due tomorrow. We have kids then calendar what they have to do, making sure it's in a calendar, and then we'll help them break down, like test on Friday into smaller components, and also put that into their calendar. That's better than a long list of, oh my gosh, you've got to do all these things. Putting it in a calendar helps kids to understand, okay, now I know when I do it, and now I know what I have to do when I do it. We also help them complete their assignments, especially if it's the assignments that are hard. We want to teach them how to tackle difficult things. And then my favorite part is really helping them do anticles because when kids um, are getting disappointing grades, it's often the case that they don't think ahead like what could go wrong. And so we'll say, okay, you you have in your calendar that um, you're going to review these Quizlets, Quizlet words, words in Quizlet, and you're going to do these practice um, games. Um, what could get you off track? And that's when kids will often say, oh, you know, the YouTube thing, or um, I've been watching a show on Netflix, and I often get off track. 
So then we'll talk about, all right, what is going to happen when you feel like you're going to get off track? And we strategize um, ways to help kids so that they know when they're on their own, this is how they can tackle it. So when kids do come home with disappointing grades, as parents, we do not want to go in right away and start lecturing them. It doesn't work because we're upset. And when we're upset, our kid will be upset. If we're feeling anxious, they're going to feel anxious. So the first step is really to give it some distance. And you might even say, I just, you know, even if your child knows you're upset, I can tell this isn't a good time to talk about this. Can we discuss this after dinner tonight? Um, does that work for you? So you're really scheduling time to talk when everybody has a cooler head. And during this time, you want to have a discussion. It's not a lecture where you're telling your child that they're not doing well. They already know that. They sense, they see their grade, they've known it for a while, and they can see that you're disappointed. Instead, it's really a conversation um, about what's happened. And so here are some conversation prompts um, that are some scenarios that I want to share with you. Um, so here's what not to do. Jimmy, I cannot believe you have five missing assignments already. No wonder you got a D in science. Mom, I turned those things in. Don't worry about it. No, you didn't. Because if you did, you clearly would have done better. You're smarter than this. And there's just conflict right off the bat. Um, or we could say, hey, Jimmy, I noticed that science is really hard um, this, this, this quarter. Tell me about that. Yeah, mom, my teacher's ridiculous. She gives us more homework than any other kid. And plus, everybody's getting a bad grade in science. Oh, tell me about that. Tell me about what's happening. Well, there's so much work. I don't even know where to start. And then you can have a discussion over it, which results in a better outcome. So although there are two scenarios, the one that's a discussion rather than a lecture is the better way to go. And we can do this by starting with those words, I've noticed. I've noticed science is hard. I've noticed um, math can be a struggle this quarter. Tell me about that. Sometimes with kids, we will also use um, scale of one to five. So scale of one to five is when you say to the student, okay, on a scale of one to five, one being awful, five being amazing, kind of like a Google review, um, how are you feeling about this subject? So if you say, how are you feeling about math? One being awful, um, three being eh, five being, you know, I'm, I'm actually really feeling good about this. I'm okay. Um, where are you? I use this with a student that I have. I volunteer with big brothers, big sisters, and I have a student and he, he's really struggling with math. And um, his teacher wrote in his assignment book, this long message about um, how he's doing. And when I met with him, um, I said, oh, tell me about math. And I used my usual things like, um, oh, I noticed math is hard. And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he just wouldn't have any of it. He was like completely shut down. And then I took out this little note card and I drew a line and I put one on one end, five on another, three in the middle. And then I put two and four. And I said, okay, on a scale of one to five, one is awful, five is great, three is eh, um, and two is kind of bad, and, and four is not so bad at all. Where, how do you feel about math? And he said, I'm a one. And I said, okay, tell me about that. And just by saying he was a one, it opened up this whole discussion. So sometimes kids don't know how to name what they're feeling, and they need a little bit of help, like a scale of one to five. Um, all right. So that's just a strategy you can use at home. Um, I found it to be helpful with kids of all ages. So we talked a lot about kids that don't understand the content. We've talked about executive functions. And we've also talked about um, what to do when you want to have a discussion with your child about bad grades. But let's talk about things that you may be asking. And then I'm going to go to the chat in a little bit. These are common questions I hear from parents. Should I set consequences? Um, should I maybe take my child's phone away? Should I say no video games for a week? Or should I restrict them from going out with their friends and saying, nope, you're staying home this weekend, no weekend activities? 
should I really take that punitive approach? Or um, should I reward my child? Like if, excuse me, they start to improve, um, should I say, oh, um, I'm going to buy you a new outfit or, oh, if you get an A, and this is pretty common, I'm going to give you $20. Should I reward them with material things? Should I say, oh, you know, if you turn this in or if you get a good grade on a test, um, we'll go out to this nice restaurant together. Or should I just say good job and praise them when they start to do better? You know, what should I do? And before we take start with consequences and before we give all these rewards out, what I will share is that praise is really the best way to start, especially when it's genuine. So we know through lots of research, um, and in fact, there's this really, really good book called um, Mindset by Carol Dweck, and she's a researcher out of Stanford. And this book is amazing, um, not just for kids, but for adults too. But she talks in the book about how the praise we give our kids makes a dramatic impact in terms of motivation and actually test scores too. So when we say things like, oh, you're smart, or you can do this because you're really smart, or um, we, we think about intelligence, it has the opposite effect towards motivation. But if we say, um, I've noticed that you're putting in effort, I see that you studied a little bit longer, and we start to praise effort, that really goes a long way because students start to see, actually, I have this in my control. Smart, I'm born with it, or if I'm not, I'm not. There's nothing I can do about it. But effort, I can put in effort. And so we want to start by praising our kids' effort. We also want to do away with things like good job and <laughs> way to go. That's not specific enough. It would need to be specific to something like, um, I love how you came home and got started with that. I started on that. Or I noticed you got off track and then you went right back to homework. I've never seen that before. That's amazing. I love how you monitored yourself. Those are all ways that we're focusing on effort. There's also a lot of research on rewards, um, you know, the short-term and long-term rewards. And what we know is that actually rewards aren't that, are, can be helpful for short-term tasks. For example, um, like if you say to your child, if you come down from sc for school, if you come downstairs by eight o'clock and you have your teeth brushed and you have your coat, you're dressed and you have your coat, you can watch TV for 15 minutes before you go to the bus stop. That would be an example of a short term re goal reward. And those types of things work. Um, so you're not giving money or you're not giving a present, you're kind of giving a privilege. Um, that works because it's within the child's control and it's based on effort. But what doesn't work is things like, um, I'm going to pay you for this grade. I had a parent come to me once after a presentation at a school and she said, her daughter was in fifth grade and she said, I don't know what I did wrong. Um, I told my daughter, who's always wanted to go to Disney World, by the way, if she got straight A's, I would take her to Disney World at the end of the quarter. It was the fourth quarter. And she started out like super, super motivated. And then um, that lasted for like four days and slowly her motivation waned. And then before she knew it, it was the same as before. And that's because getting good grades is extremely complex. There's a lot that goes into it and it's nine, nine weeks away. So that doesn't work. So we don't want to reward long-term things at all. We want to start with praise and then do something short-term if needed, um, but based on a privilege. All right, some other common questions. What should I do if my child lacks motivation? Here's the thing. Um, this is a self-determination theory. Motivation that's inside you, like you want to do this because you, um, this is something important to you, has to fill three um, criteria. One, the student has to know that they can do it. They feel competent. Okay, this is hard for me, but I know I can do this. I know if I study in this way or I do these practice problems, I will get to the point where I get this. I may not be able to do it right now, um, but I will be able to do this. They feel competent in their abilities. 
Um, for me, when I was a kid, I did not feel competent. And this was a major issue for me. So when kids have content issues, it's often tied back to their lack of competence. They, it's not only that they don't think they can do it, but they often don't have the skills. Um, sometimes kids feel like they're micromanaged. And in order to be intrinsically motivated, you have to feel a sense of autonomy. So is it that somebody's barking orders at you and yelling at you to start your homework and get better grades? If that's the case, you may not feel like you have much autonomy. You might feel more like you're micromanaged. And then this is probably the biggest thing. Do you see the purpose behind what you're doing? So earlier I mentioned the kid that didn't think he needed to know the Pythagorean theorem because in reality, when will he ever use this in life? Is he, if he's a theater major, chances are probably not. But kids that are able to say, okay, I, this is dumb. I'm never going to use this in life, but I still want to get a good grade because that's going to help me with my GPA and allow me to study the thing I want or go to college where I want or have choices. That's a sense of purpose. And so when we see kids fall down in one or a couple of these areas, it's often the reason they struggle with that internal motivation. Um, and so when we think of kids that, that struggle in these areas, one thing that we want to do, and one thing that my parents did for me is they helped me with the competence piece by getting me a tutor, but they also saw that maybe school was kind of going to be hard for me, but that I could do great things in life. And I loved kids. I wanted to be a teacher. And so they allowed me to have kids over to my house after school. And I tutored younger students. They allowed me to run summer camps in my backyard in the summer. And those things feel, made me feel good about myself. And they gave me purpose. Um, so for your child who loves sports, school might be hard. Make sure they, they, the sport is not taken away from them. Maybe the thing that they do is um, they find other joy in sports, not just playing, but maybe they raise, um, collect used cleats and give those to disadvantaged kids. Maybe your daughter loves art. It's not valued a much, that much in schools. So you make sure she's able to take art lessons and she's able to um, really make sure that her, the natural passions she has are addressed in life. Other questions. How do I talk to my child's teacher about grades? What if I think that the teacher um, could be doing things differently? Well, first, teachers are under incredible stress right now. And so we want to tread gently when we talk to teachers. Using the words I've noticed, just like we use the words with I've noticed with kids, works wonders. So instead of you give too much homework or um, my son said he didn't know this was going to be on the test. You might say, I've noticed um, Sarah is really having a hard time with science. Um, what can I do on my end to help? What are you seeing on your end? So it's more like a collaboration. And those things mean a lot to teachers. And the teacher will be much more willing to work with you if they feel like you're a partner together. So in the end, when it comes to our kids, we want to make sure that we are proactive with grades, whether it's competence, whether um, it's a sense of purpose, or whether it's that our child wants to work more independently, we are here to help you. This is what we do every day for kids. Um, and I have Kathy, Jennifer, and Ann Stewart that every day talk to parents about the issues their kids are facing and are happy to talk to you about your child to see if we can be a match whether it's a tutor, an executive function coach, or a mixture of both, um, you can scan this QR code and it will take you to their calendar and you can schedule a free, no obligation, super quick consultation, usually about 20 minutes to talk about your child. And we're happy to help. Um, you can also go to our website, which is ectutoring.com and find out more information about our services. Um, lastly, I want to mention that we have another webinar coming up. This one is for um, older students, high school age kids. It's actually um, this coming Monday um, and it's called an insider's perspective to the seven common college admissions questions. And this is with our college consultant, David Volane, who is amazing by the way. 
Um, and he's been on the other side. So he's been uh, a college admissions reader where he's the one making decisions about whether kids are accepted, denied, or waitlisted. Um, and he's just so full of knowledge. So I hope that you can come to that. You can register by going to our website, ectutoring.com slash webinar dash series. All right, so I would love to go to Q&A. We have about 35 minutes left. Um, so if you have a question, please throw it into the chat. And um, I wanna make sure I get to everybody's questions. So thank you for that. All right, so um, these are some things that people said early on or what ha what's happening in, at their homes. Um, somebody said the fighting arguing between me and my teenager has um, feels like it's just over the top. And yes, I mean, we all feel like that at times. So Cindy, thank you for sharing that. I, um, I hope that I was able to solve some of the issues when it comes to having meaningful discussions instead of lectures. And really when we wanna um, share strategies with our kids, they won't listen to anything we say unless we first work on the relationship with them. Um, one mom said, Alessandra, I'm concerned that my son went from A's and B's the last three years. Um, now he's in fourth grade and he has D's and F's. I don't understand the difference. And I'm struggling with the school, i.e. the IEP initiation and getting in touch with teachers. So it sounds like um, there has been a great shift. And there could be a number of reasons for this. I used to teach fourth grade. And I remember it being a big transition point because and one, two, and three, you're kind of um, learning content. You know, you're learning how to read or you're learning how to do the math. When you get a little bit older, you're really learning a little bit more how to learn. And so it, we, ex we expect that you can read and you can do basic writing. And so now it's a whole different level. So for sometimes kids in a tr transition year like fourth grade, definitely seventh grade and definitely ninth grade, it is really common to have a glitch um, but this is severe, Alessandra, what you're what you're talking about. So I'm glad you got an IEP. That will help a lot. And if you're having a hard time getting in touch with the teachers, I would go above and see if you have an IEP, you have a case manager. Go see your case manager um, and see if you can elevate it even further to the counselor. Um, and if necessary, somebody even above the counselor. But Sometimes you, we, as parents, we have like not a great experience with one person. And so we can't just rest, rest there and say, oh, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. Maybe it will get better. No. If this is really an issue, go find somebody else at the school who can help you. Um, I've noticed that my son is studying over time for tests, but he's still not getting a good result. Carrie, thank you for sharing. First of all, kudos to your son for not cramming, that's huge, um, that he's using that concept of distributed practice. What I may also recommend is to investigate and be a detective, how is he studying? Um, is he studying by reviewing his notes? If so, that may not be the best way for him to study. It probably isn't. I might go to learningscientist.org, that's the website I mentioned, with him. Don't go without him, just say, I heard about this, and I heard that these scientists have figured out how kids' brains work and how they can get better grades and retain information. I don't know, it might work for you, it might not. Do you wanna see it together and see what they're saying? And so by saying something like, I don't know, it might work for you, it might not, it takes the pressure off of the student and look at it together, look at all the ways. And by the way, it's great because there's lots of illustrations and fun things. Um, and there's videos, which I love. So it's super kid friendly and see, ask, tell me about ways in which you're studying is one of these on learning scientists. Um, if not, which one do you think might be most effective to you? But I might draw attention to the self-testing because again, that trumps everything else. And there's a big section on learning scientists about ways to create practice tests for yourself. Um, Amanda says, it's been hard because I'm emotional about my son's grades and he does not seem to care. How do we explain the importance of school to kids? Um, Amanda, I get it. You know, I, my parents were, especially my father was very type A. My brother was extremely smart. He always got straight A's. And I always felt, I, it looked to my parents like I didn't care, but I did care. 
Um, and I've seen that with kids over the years. I've, I've had educational connections for 25 years. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of kids, even the toughest kids. When you peel back the layer of the onion, they care. They just don't want to look like they care because it's a shield they have. If I don't look like I care and then I do a bad job and get a bad grade, well, it's just because I don't care and I didn't really try. It feels um, harder when you say I put in all this effort and now I'm not doing well. That feels like I'm a failure. So it's kind of a shield kids often put up. Um, I would sit down and have a discussion with him and really just start by asking how he's feeling about things when you are not emotional. Because uh, again, if you're stressed, he's stressed. I would do it at a time when maybe you see a good grade or something's going well, not at a bad time. Um, that's the best time. And if you feel that you are really struggling with this, bring in outside help. Um, it could be a tutor. It could be an executive function coach. It could be a therapist. It could be if he's feeling low about other parts in his life and not just school, there may be other issues at play and a good therapist can help a lot. Um, you know, one of my kids, he's seen a therapist off and on. He's an adult now. And I tell you, it really helped him to uncover why he felt like he struggled with motivation from time to time. But ultimately, if we can get to the bottom of it um, and we can help our kids to see what they're good at too and really nourish the things that they love to do, at the end of the day and at the end of college, we can all visualize that our kids will graduate. They're going to be okay. And honestly, they may struggle with motivation from time to time throughout their school career. But if they can learn the tools to help them, that's what we want so that they can go off to college if that's what they decide to do. And they have tools in their back pocket to help. But we often have to bring in outside resources to help if we're feeling ultra, like super stressed over the situation. Um, my son feels like he should have gotten an A when he did not complete his assignments. He feels entitled to a good grade. Um, and I've worked with kids like that. And it's usually the blame game. You know, they're, they want to blame the situation on other people really to save face. Sometimes the student is feeling insecure. Um, so no matter what we say, and if we say things like, well, if you studied harder, maybe it would help if you did your homework. Um, kids, sarcasm doesn't always work with kids. And so if that's the case, what I might recommend is having a discussion, maybe sitting down with a teacher. So it's a three-way discussion. And it's not just you saying, well, you should have talked to your teacher or no, your teacher's not that bad. But if it's a discussion with the teacher and you're able to troubleshoot and come up with ways to deal with these obstacles, that is a better discussion. Because if your child isn't really owning up to it and it's two-sided, you and your child, without the other piece of the triangle, it may not go, it may not go anywhere until your child matures a little bit. So by keeping bringing the teacher in, I think that may be a better dynamic in the triangle than just you and your child. Um, how do I handle it when my 13-year-old daughter suddenly starts struggling to complete schoolwork? It just started this year in seventh grade. We see this a lot in seventh grade. It's a huge transition year, seventh grade and ninth grade. Um, and if you're seeing that this is something new, sometimes it's an adjustment period. But if you're seeing it more than a quarter, like she's not, it, it's like an issue that seems to be chronic, not just, a, you know, just a few weeks, then I would absolutely go and talk to the teachers. If it's, if it's just one teacher, talk to that teacher, um, say, I've noticed she's having a hard time completing her schoolwork. Ask, maybe you speak to the counselor as well and really bring in resources to help figure out what's going on. And then of course, um, because seventh grade is such a pivotal year, middle school is the hardest time for kids. Not only are they dealing with their academics, but they're trying to find their identity and they're also dealing with friends. Those three things can be a perfect storm. So I wouldn't let it go. 
I think you're doing the right thing by noticing. And I would reach out to the teachers, maybe the counselor, and then um, get outside help through maybe an executive function coach if it's a completion issue to help her in those areas. Um, Jennifer said, my daughter went from an A to an F in math and she doesn't seem to care sometimes. Okay, so math is that cumulative subject I mentioned where one skill builds upon another. So it sounds like if she went from an A to an F, it's more than that. She may not um, have some of the, the basics but the other issue may be um, with the teacher or with brand new content. Sometimes when kids go from algebra to geometry, it's a change. Or they go from geometry to algebra two because they haven't seen algebra one in a while. So try to figure out um, what is it and um, get help because in a cumulative subject like math, you don't want it to go for too long without making sure whether it's the college student down the street the teacher twice a week after school or a tutor, kids need help in cumulative subjects. Um, my son is not on top of his schoolwork and I feel like I'm always riding him and I am. I don't want to feel my own anxiety mounting when he falls behind. And Jennifer, I hear you. Um, I felt like that with my oldest son too. And I noticed I became a lot more anxious at certain times in the quarter myself I because I didn't want him to experience what I experienced. And also in doing this and working with a lot of kids, I knew what could go wrong too. Um, and I noticed always at a test, when he was going to have a test and always when he had a bunch of unit exams at the end of the quarter, my anxiety would be like this. And I started to see a pattern in myself. He seemed not to care as much, although he really did. Um, but I realized I have to step back as a parent and I can't, um, it didn't help at all. Like the more anxious I became, I thought he might care more. It didn't work like that. Um, it doesn't work like that with kids. And so what I would say is monitor your own feelings first. Um, do you see a pattern in it? And if so, could you bring in somebody else to work with him in these areas? Um, you know, sometimes kids will say, I don't need help. I don't want to work with somebody else. And, you know, I had throughout my schooling, that was my case too. I thought I've got this, I can do this, but they do need help. Um, and oftentimes we get super resistant kids. They, they say, I don't need this. Um, and once we figure out what's happening, we may, they might say, I'm not, I don't want you to help me with being organized, but I will accept your help in science. We're not going to go in and help them with organization. They won't have that right now. They will let us help them with science. And so that's where we start. So we try to figure out not only what is causing their bad grades or their disappointing grades, but what are they willing to let us help with? Um, and many of the other webinars, I do a section on this thing called the stages of change. And whenever kids are feeling low um, and they want to change their behavior, uh, really whenever anybody wants to change their behavior. It could be, um, I want to drink less. It could be, I want to exercise more. It could be, I want to lose 10 pounds. I want to eat better. All these things, we're at different places in this thing called the ladder of change. Sometimes we say, we don't want to change at all. Sometimes we say, I'm not sure if I need to change. Sometimes we're super willing to make change. A lot of times kids come to us and they're at the bottom of the ladder and they'll say, you know, I don't know if I really even have a problem. I think I'm okay. And really it's, it's finding that rapport between the educator and the child so that the child is saying, I like working with this person. Um, this person's a good match for me. Uh, this is helping me. Oftentimes it is figuring out the way in and making sure there's a good match. And that's really what helps kids to overcome this feeling like I don't care because underneath it all, they do care. All right, um, let's see some other questions. We have just a couple of minutes. Um, would starting medication help to improve outcomes? I prefer to wait, but when do I know if my child needs to take medication? Medication. First, um, certainly talk with your pediatrician. They're the best person to give advice on medication. I can tell you anecdotally, 
Um, medication certainly will not help kids organize their backpacks, but medication can help kids um, be more focused and um, be able to um, sustain effort on things that they don't really want to do. And that is really the true test of attention. You know, anybody can pay attention to anything they like to do. You know, anybody that loves video games can play Xbox for three hours. But the true test is, can you make yourself do something you don't want to do? And like your math homework and medication can help with that. Um, so often it's not just medication alone, but it is medication in combination with other support that can really be the secret sauce. And I've seen so many kids do well on medication. Um, and so it just kind of depends on your situation, your personal views, and also the need of your child and, and your pediatrician as well. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody said, um, can self-regulation be taught? This is our last question. And um, it can. Self-regulation is the highest or executive function skill, which means out of all the executive function skills, this is the last one that comes online. It's the hardest one for kids to develop. And so we often see kids do, you know, foolish things, take risky behaviors, have risky behaviors when they're teenagers because their executive functions aren't quite fully developed. Um, and they don't really monitor their behavior well. But when it comes to academics, it can be taught. And that's the part of the session when I talked about, we discuss what obstacles are you gonna encounter? Cause there are always, always obstacles kids face, especially in this age of everything being digital. You know, they're, they're working on their laptop. Um, you know, maybe they are um, annotating um, a history page, but at the same time, they're, you know, something, they have another window open and they're playing a game or they're texting with their friends. They've got their phone next to them. Um, all these things happen, right? And so self-regulation is when you say to yourself, okay, um, I know I'm going to have these distractions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my phone in airplane mode. I'm going to close out all my windows and I'm going to set my timer for 20 minutes. And I'm just going to do this only for 20 minutes or maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Because you know that if you have these other screens open and your text messages are going off um, and you're getting all these alerts or alarms, then you're just going to inherently be distracted. So by predicting what's going to happen, um, anticipating that obstacle, and then coming up with strategies, that is how you develop self-regulation. You may not always be good at it, but you can have strategies in your back pocket. And it's those strategies that we want kids to have so that ultimately when they go off to college and they're not in our purview like they are now, they can pull out those strategies from their back pocket and use them when it really counts. So um, I hope that has been helpful to everybody. It was such a pleasure to see you today. Um, if we can be of assistance, we are always here for you. I wish you all the best for the second, third, and fourth quarters this year. Have a great school year and goodbye.